Um, thank you. I'm very, very pleased to be here today. And I would like to thank the organizers for having done uh, such a marvelous job of bringing this conference together and bringing this group of people together. I think um, in my professional experience so far, it has been um, one of the most successful conferences I have seen, um, and certainly one of the most interesting, uh, in not only because I think uh, it's, it's touching on a number of key issues in common, but also because it, it gives us a sense of both the breadth and range of issues and contact points among areas that, when we work by ourselves, seem quite disparate. Um, Obscured Objects of Desire, the title of this talk, uh, of course, refers to Bunuel's 1977 film, That Obscure Object of Desire, in which a middle-aged Frenchman pursues a Spanish woman played by two different actresses. Um, um, the film plays with two different meanings of the word obscure. Obscure can mean strange and abstruse, not easily understood. Um, in one sense, the film emphasizes the lability of the female uh, main character, with each actress playing different qualities of the same person, hot versus cold, seductive versus repelling, coy versus direct. Um, but if we examine the male protagonist, something a little bit more sinister emerges, probably uh, because I've been thinking about Trump recently. Um, his own delusions about the woman or women he desires. He doesn't see what the audience sees. Two different women, not one. This reading of the film emphasizes another dimension of the term obscure, meaning hidden or veiled. From this point of view, the film is less about a woman who is obscure than about a male protagonist from whom the world itself is obscured by his own misperceptions, his own fantasies. And I think the development of what we could call, based on uh, Noemi's discussion this morning, informal markets um, in African objects in the 1920s can be seen as similarly obscure. Um, the informal markets produced narratives about Africans and African objects as mysterious, primitive, and unknowable on the one hand. But on the other, they were also characterized by the systematic blindness of Europeans and North Americans toward the ways in which their own delusions and fantasies, their own ideologies and investments in certain ideas and racial hierarchies about Africans shaped the informal markets for the objects they avidly sought. Um, I'll discuss this issue uh, of the, and this obscuring by closely examining the informal export market for objects in the Bamum Kingdom in the 1920s. I'll talk about what I consider to be two sort of puzzles or paradoxes that structured this market and were also produced by it at the time. The first is the paradox of traditional art or of traditional society and its relationship to artworks. Um, and the second is the fake. Um, this is a term that I've sort of stayed away from in previous research, but I want to get into it a little bit here. My point is that the demand for African objects created certain contradictions unfolding as it did within the framework of ideas that supported European and American views about Africa. I also wish to suggest that the agency of, that um, the contradictions were also shaped by the agency of Africans reacting to and adapting to the developing market situation. Looking carefully makes abundantly clear that um, in the Bamum Kingdom, the Africans responded to the demands of Europeans and North Americans, playing to and with the perceptions of their clients. Um, but first, a little bit of background about the Bamum Kingdom is necessary. Um, Bamum is a good example for exploring these themes. The kingdom, its history, and its art have all been comparatively intensively studied. Um, because of the role the kingdom played in the German and French colonial periods, and because of the prominence of Bamum art in German, French, and North American collections, um, it can be seen as an exemplary case, as well as a case um, that shaped the dynamics of local and formal markets. Um, to the history itself, just before the start of the German colonial era, the Bamum Kingdom was probably the largest and wealthiest um, of a number of um, political entities in what is today Cameroon. Although it had been connected indirectly to the Atlantic world by trade um, for many, many years, Europeans didn't arrive in the kingdom until 1902. At the time, um, the Bamum Kingdom was ruled by an energetic young monarch, Njoya, um, and had emerged from a period of protracted crisis and civil war. 
um, King Joya embarked on a course of alliance with the Germans, seeking to bolster his own position inside the kingdom, uh, as well as his regional position. Because of its size and wealth, the kingdom was known for the opulence and diversity of its art, centered on the royal court, but also for works from the lineages and noble houses outside the capital of Fumban. And here we see an example of um, a court mask as well as um, a mask that I would tentatively put uh, as a regional mask outside of the kingdom. Uh, probably not so tentatively. Um, but I think its status as, as a real mask is something that we'll get into a little bit later. Um, Joya lavished gifts on his German allies, and many of the German and Swiss missionaries, traders, and researchers who came to the kingdom acquired remarkable objects from, from him, um, as well as on the market in, in the main square of Fumban. The Germans cultivated a myth of King Joya, and this is an example of royal gifts. Um, the Germans cultivated a myth of King Joya and the Bamun people as exceptional among Africans, noble, beautiful, intelligent. This myth simultaneously served not only to hold up the Bamum kingdom as exemplary, but also to reinforce negative myths and stereotypes about other Africans as degenerate, ugly, corrupt, and stupid. Um, the First World War changed the situation dramatically. Although King Joya sought to maintain his relative independence, the territory of his kingdom was given over to French control. Um, over the 1920s, after a series of conflicts with French administrators, he was stripped of his political power and sent into internal exile at his estate at the far eastern border, border of the kingdom in Mantum. Um, a main beneficiary of his political fall was his distant cousin, Mose Yayap. Over the same time period, the artistic and cultural traditions of the kingdom changed radically. By 1917, the royal court had for the most part converted to Islam. From 1917 to 1922, the main royal palace in Fumban had been torn down and reconstructed a number of times, eventually um, resulting in um, a building that was quite you know, has been considered a kind of hybrid style, um, unifying elements of colonial architecture as well as Islamic architecture from the north of Cameroon. Um, following the conflicts with French administrators, the court societies um, and their festivals, um, particularly called Nguan and Ja, with masquerades and opulent objects, costumes and performances, were more or less suppressed. Um, new forms of artistic expression um, such as drawing, calligraphy, and low-relief carving emerged with vitality, while older forms such as sculpture and masquerade um, languished. At the same time, the demand for objects from Africa, including objects from the Cameroon grass fields in Europe and a little bit later North America, grew tremendously part of an insatiable desire, first for oddities, then for ethnological specimens, and then for art. Although I think as we saw in Yael's talk, I mean, these categories often overlapped, converged, and diverged in different ways. Um, the demand for objects from African artists and artisans had actual market effects. The first puzzle or paradox that I want to talk about centers on the role of the idea of tradition or traditional society in shaping the informal markets for objects from Bamum. One of the clearest demands by Europeans and North Americans who sought to obtain objects in Fumban in the 1920s was that the objects be a direct expression of Bamum society and culture. Yet the idea of what such traditional society looked like was not something the Europeans were really curious about. It was something they projected onto um, Bamum people at the time. Um, Europeans defined what kind of objects they believed were traditional what motifs were traditional, and so on. They were not passive observers of Bamum culture, not passive consumers of what was already there. Um, they were active shapers of it, and their fantasy bore very little relationship to reality. It's plain that the social and cultural conditions within which Bamum artists from the early years of the 20th century worked were undergoing profound transformations. From 1902, the direct presence of Europeans in Fumban was unmistakable, and by 1924, the political and cultural and religious context was strikingly different than it had been two decades earlier. Um, new forms of visual expression like these had taken center stage. Um, crucially, too, in the 19... 
you know, and, and uh, in the 1920s, um, sorry, I seem to have missed a slide here, but that's okay, we'll just skip on ahead. Uh, crucially, too, in the 1920s, Bamum artists and craftspeople had organized into an artist collective, the artisanat, and were making a range of goods in styles and forms. And here we see a slightly later advertisement for the goods of the artisanat, and it gives you a sense of what was actually the kind of thing that Bamum artists and craftsmen were trying to make and trying to market. Um, cloth, um, embroidered cloth, um, batiks, tea services with napkins and serviettes, um, uh, stools sculpted, um, tables sculpted, um, pearled calabashes. And so you see a, a sort of mixture of what one could consider older traditional forms, but predominantly um, sort of newer things that would have come in um, with European taste as well as Islamic taste from the north. Yet traditional art, that is, the older forms and genres were what Europeans demanded. We know this because Europeans were very explicit about their demands. Eugène Pitard, the director of the Ethnographic Museum of Geneva at the time, wrote to Mosé Yayap, the king's cousin, asking for objects to assemble as true a picture as possible of the population of which you are a part. That is to say, of the material life of this population. He then listed precisely the kind of objects he wanted to form that picture. I strongly desire to have sculpted wood masks, statues, carved horns, etc. Among the musical instruments, I would like to have sculpted drums with carved animals or other designs. Miss DeBarge, a mutual acquaintance, showed me drawings on paper that you made of sculptures. Is it possible to have these sculptures themselves? Pitard did not ask Yayap what was characteristic of Bamum society at the time. He didn't seek to inform himself directly about the kinds of things being made by Bamum artists, the kinds of objects that, that constituted the material culture he said he wanted, or the changes that Bamum art and society had undergone. Instead, Pitard presented Yeyap with a shopping list of items that he wanted and how he wanted them to look. Pitard had no independent experience of Bamum material culture. He could form an idea of what Bamum art and cultural objects might have looked like, mainly from viewing German collections or reading publications about the Bamum kingdom, or through indirectly communications with intermediaries such as Josette de Barge. But fundamentally, he did not and could not know what contemporary art and culture in the Bamum kingdom looked like. His understanding necessarily lagged temporally behind developments in the kingdom itself. But crucially, Pitard assumed that he knew. And, he based, and based on his assumed understanding, he formulated his demands. Pitard was by no means alone. Other Europeans and North American collectors worked under similar misapprehensions. George Schwab, for instance, acquired an entire truckload of objects from Harvard University from Mosé Yayap. He eschewed the kinds of objects he thought were, quote, modern stuff, preferring to acquire things he believed were characteristic of Bamum society, masks, carved tusks, an immense carved drum. A little bit later, Henri Labouret, a French cultural anthropologist, also acquired a collection of similar kinds of objects. Crucially, by the late 1920s, such objects no longer represented Bamum modernity in any immediate sense. Just as crucially, the demands by Europeans and North Americans led to changes in the art that was being produced in the Bamum kingdom, and how Bamum artists, craftsmen, and how Yeyap, as the main person who promoted and represented them, portrayed Bamum culture. By the 1920s, Bamum masquerades and festivals from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as I said, had ceased to take place. But under Mose Yeyap, um, people began to put on new performances. For example, in December 1929, in conjunction with a visit by the French governor, Yeyap organized a, se a, a set of festivities in the capital. The events prominently included masquerades, musical performances, dances, stage tableau of things that deliberately invoked a fictional Bamum past. But crucially, the performances were not actually revivified older court rituals or masquerades. And at least, as it's, at least as insofar as it's possible to reconstruct them from the accounts of earlier German missionaries, researchers, colonial administrators, and visitors. 
But it is also clear that the Bamum people taking part in the festivities did so with an eye to historical styles, objects, and practices. They dressed up in costumes um, in the style of things from before the pre-colonial era. They used new objects that looked like older ones, and they made up creative anachronisms. That is, they projected back at the Europeans and North Americans precisely the kinds of things that the Europeans and North Americans expected and wanted to see. The objects in the masquerades and other events were largely freshly made or came from the lineages outside the capital. They ran the gamut of works of extraordinary artistic creativity. You know, we see here, hope that this will, whoops, sorry, um, that this will work. Um, this piece, which you know, has an extraordinary plastic appeal, sculptural appeal, um, to crudely fashioned works of lesser caliber. They used materials that were a far cry from the opulent masks and other objects that had been at the center of life at court. And here you just see the, the, the very difference in sort of the materials that were being used. But what is very clear is that the masks and stools and many of the other objects that were on display in 1929 at the festivities did not comport either with what was at fashion at the royal court or a great deal of what Bamum artists were choosing themselves to produce, at least in terms of what they were advertising. So we need to think back to the ad that they actually produced and said, this is what we have for sale. The anachronistic and fantastical character of the events and many of the objects on display can be seen when one begins to pair, compare images of the period carefully. Um, for instance, George Schwab, the Harvard ethnologist, photographed a tableau of someone sitting on a two-figure seat surrounded by supporters. That's this up here. Um, this is the seat. You just have to believe me. You can barely see the faces, but it is the seat. Um, the captions for the images make clear that Schwab or someone close to him working with the images thought the person on the seat was a Bamum chief or sub-king and that the seat was a throne. Of course, the seat resembles a central throne of the Bamum kings, Mandu Yenu, and the way the sub-king is sitting on it resembles the manner in which King Joya actually used Mandu Yenu a, a, a few years earlier. So this is King Joya, and he's sitting on um, not this throne, but a later one that's very similar in style. And you can see that, that this sort of thing with the, with the supporters surrounding the king, the king disporting himself you know, in a very similar position on the throne, that that's actually a reconstruction of earlier ways in which the king would have showed himself. Um, king Joya, um, over the years, however, court styles and fashions had changed dramatically. Um, king Joya chose to present himself in many different ways for photographers, and he did so always consciously and deliberately. Other members of the royal family did so as well. These images are convincing evidence for how far Bamum court styles and fashions, in particular those for the king and female members of the royal family, were from what George Swab uh, photographed in 1929. And here we see um, two earlier photographs of King Joya, one from 1912, one from 1908, and then here contrasted with how the man is presenting himself as a king in 1929, not, not King Joya, someone different. And you see that there's, I mean, there's, th these are worlds apart. Um, it, it gets even more dramatic when you look at the photographs of supposedly royal women. This is how Bamum royal women dressed in 1908. This is how they dressed in 1933, and yet in 1929, the women surrounding the king are supposed to be dressing like this. And remember, this is in a Muslim context. These are, these are women who are members of the royal family which has converted to Islam. I mean, this is, this is if you think about it for just a second, completely implausible. Um, the events of 29 can at least in part be understood as part of a process of shaping a representation of Bamum art and culture that was at odds with contemporary reality. European visitors, including the French governor, but also the missionaries and ethnologists such as Schwab, were offered a fantasy of Bamum culture at those festivities that comported with their own preconceptions. Half-naked royal women, a king on his throne su supported by his supporters, magicians and powerful objects adorned with human bones. Um, uh, you know, uh, surrounding the king. Primitive Africa was on display and offered up for the consumption of visitors to Fumban in 1929. This brings me to the second puzzle or paradox that I'd like to discuss today, and that is 
uh, the irony of fakes. The term fake is loaded, particularly with respect to art from Africa. And I think we've already seen that in a couple of the discussions today. I don't want to get into defining it here or applying it to specific works of art in particular collections. Instead, I'd like to step back for a moment and ask how a certain logic of authenticity worked to shape the informal markets in Bamum in the 1920s. Europeans and North Americans wanted objects that fulfilled their image of Bamum society and tradition. The kinds of objects they believed fulfilled such criteria were those that were both old and made in isolation from external, that is, European influences. How do we know this? Again, Eugène Pitard was very clear on this point. He insisted on one point. Our intent is to have the oldest objects, those which have not been subjected to European influence. Okay, first, it's necessary to observe how nonsensical Pitard's criteria were, especially with regard to objects from the Bamum kingdom. For instance, if we look just at the materials of Manduyenu, the cowrie shells and glass beads that adorned the most opulent royal objects were imported from as far away as the Indian Ocean and the Habsburg Empire. They were only available in the Bamum Kingdom because it was connected to the global trade in commodities and luxury goods before Europeans physically arrived there. That is, Bamum court art was necessarily already global. Um, but Pitao's two criteria, age and lack of external influence, was a desire that objects be authentic. Of course, the desire for old, authentic objects tapped into all kinds of ideas about Africans as primitive, African societies as unchanging, and so on. But the desire, I think, also betrays an insecurity about collecting and about the market. Europeans and North Americans, on one level, were anxious that what they were collecting was not what they believed they were collecting, that the objects could be, so to say, fake. Why would the issue of acquiring new objects that reflected European influence on Bamum society be a source of anxiety? I think there are a number of answers to this, and I think we'll get into this more in the next talk as well. But one answer that I'd like to highlight here is that I think from the perspective of earlier generations of scholars from the first decades of the 20th century who studied Bamum material culture, the anxiety probably would have made little sense. That is, the anxiety, I think, is in this context slightly new. Um, for those scholars, particularly those from the Berlin Museum for Völkerkunde, the previous name of the museum that employs me now, um, objects from societies that were seen to lack writing were material documents that witnessed that society's state of development. The analogy of document goes a little bit further than one might think, I would suggest, although this is a, an area of research that I'm working on. Understood as documents, it was not necessary that the physical object or document actually be original. Just as a facsimile of a document or a reprint or a copy can be sufficient to convey a document's content, facsimiles or copies of objects were not necessarily problematic for transmitting ideas about culture they could substitute for so-called original objects. In this sense, before 1908, the Berlin ethnologist Bernhard Ankermann was not particularly bothered if the Berlin Museum could only acquire a facsimile of Manduyenu, if it were indeed impossible to convince King Joya to part with it. The museum was perfectly willing to ship beads, glass beads, and other materials to make the facsimile to Cameroon if necessary. Um, I'll hazard then that the anxiety about fakes stems, at the time at least in Fumban, stems from another issue. The gnawing fear among colonialists and missionaries in Fumban that they were not in control, but that they were being controlled by the very people they thought they should control. That is, if a colonial collector could be duped into buying fakes, then the Africans who were supposed to be his or her inferiors were instead actually in control. On some level, I'm going to say that in Fumban in the 1920s, the concern about fakes is a concern about colonial and racial hierarchies being overturned. But a fundamental irony um, is that by demanding the kinds of objects that they did, 
masks, statues, seats, etc., objects that Bamum artists were no longer making and that Bamum people were no longer really using, the Europeans, in a sense, required Bamum artists and artisans to make objects to deceive them. Old royal objects were in short supply or were not available for a number of reasons by the 1920s. Nevertheless, Mose Yeyap and artists from the Artisanat sought to meet the demands of their foreign clients. They understood these demands very well. Yeyap wrote back, whoops, Yeyap wrote back to Pitard that he would, quote, try and find very old objects. And he noted that they were precious. One can read Yeyap's response as an attempt to subtly d divert Pitao towards accepting objects in new styles, drawings, for instance. But although the G Geneva Museum acquired works on paper that are today among the most outstanding Bamum drawings and paintings, Pitao, as we saw earlier, insisted on statues, masks, drums, and so forth. At the 1929 festivities, Bamum artists and dealers offered a range of objects for sale. Many things, particularly some of the masks, seem to have come from the villages and lineages outside Fomban and may indeed have been quite old at the time. But many of them were not. Um, and at the same time, many of the other objects were new but made to look like older works. It's very clear that Bamum artists had very little choice in terms of what works they produced and how they produced them. Um, again, I come back to that advertisement. They offered certain kinds of objects for sale, and we know based on what actually sold at the time and has made its way into other public collections that the majority of the so-called non-traditional objects did not sell. Um, faced with a limited supply of objects that actually met their clients' demands, and with clients unwilling to acquire other kinds of objects, Bamum artists and craftspeople did their best to satisfy their clients' desires and adopted a number of strategies to square the proverbial circle. As I've explained elsewhere, the festivities themselves were part of this sort of logic of authentication. Um, in other words, dancing the objects in front of the prospective clients in a way stood in as a system to prove that they were actually real masks, um, even if they weren't. Um, the object um, at the time, in effect then, the European and North American concern about not collecting fakes had the opposite effect than was intended. It spurred the production of new objects and induced Bamum artists to become more sophisticated in marketing them. I'd like to close by saying that the art market in Fumban thus remains a place of obscured transactions, obscured objects, the play of European and North American desires, and the responses of Bamum artists, traders, and dealers to meet them. Thank you. <laughs>